Torches of Freedom, a nickname that used to refer to cigarettes. Why, you ask? Well, the answer to that simple question gets a whole lot darker when you actually know the story. A story about deception, backstabbing, loopholes, and health crises. A story of a man who changed the way we see the world. Or in all reality, prove that you can make people see the world however you like. All you need is a distraction. The year is 1920. A year earlier, women had just earned the right to vote in the form of the 19th Amendment. But despite the right to vote, there were still intense social norms that prevented women from doing many things deemed masculine. Being a lawyer, having a blue collar job, joining the military, and yes, smoking. While smoking wasn't outlawed for women, the social pressure was intense. Private rooms were used to remove smoking women from others in restaurants. And in New York, there was even a city ordinance banning women from smoking in public. This was because smoking amongst women was a sign of loose morals and poor sexual behavior. Largely due to the appearance of cigarettes in pornographic magazines and the portrayal of smoking by prostitutes in the media. At the time, tobacco advertising was exclusively targeting men. The only time women were featured was if they were young and attractive. Essentially, simple sex sells marketing. However, by the late 1920s, there was a rise in the number of women smoking cigarettes, and thus the question of opening the cigarette market to women came into question. This was seen as a golden opportunity for President of American Tobacco, George W. Hill, who when asked about the change in public sentiment, stated, it will be like opening a new gold mine right in our front yard. Early cigarette campaigns targeting women were, let's say, flashy. Claims that cigarettes can make you more attractive, thinner, and even satisfy hunger cravings. These claims had cigarettes flying off the shelves, particularly the brand Lucky Strikes, who pioneered this style of advertising with their slogan, Reach for a Lucky instead of a Sweet. A campaign preying on young women that netted American tobacco a 200% increase in market share. For the majority of history, marketing could be, for the most part, boiled down to a simple statement about the benefits of a product. For the first time ever, it was not the product being sold, but the lifestyle around it. And who was the mastermind behind this? Meet Edward Bernays, an up-and-coming public relations expert in the 1920s Bernays was hired by American Tobacco in 1928 to assist in selling one of their most well-known cigarette brands, Lucky Strikes. He was born in Austria in 1891 and was the nephew of the great Sigmund Freud. He moved to America at a young age to pursue a career in agriculture, but would end up landing a job as an amateur journalist. This is where Bernays first learned of his love and natural skill for spinning stories. He would eventually make his way into the world of marketing and promotion, where he began to write press releases for theatrical plays. He would often promote some of the more controversial productions in the most provocative of ways, finding him a great amount of success in industry. It was clear people had a love for the shocking, and Bernays knew this, no matter how much backlash he got. People want to go where they wanted to be led. This caught the attention of the U.S. Committee on Public Information, who hired Bernays to shift public opinion on the First World War. Bernays thrived in this position, creating many of the most famous propaganda posters, even labeling himself a master of propaganda. Inspired by his work for the Department of Information, Bernays would write his most famous book, simply entitled Propaganda, which employed Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory to teach future PR men how to mass manipulate. Propaganda was a book that really displayed Bernays' willingness to bend his moral values, but probably not as much as his work for the Beech Nut Packing Company to improve their sales of bacon in the early 1920s. At this time, a healthy breakfast was defined by small portions and the consumption of milk. To overcome this social hurdle, Bernays approached 5,000 doctors and through many manners of persuasion, convinced thousands to sign a statement promoting a hearty breakfast of steak, 
bacon, and eggs as the new ideal healthy breakfast. He would then turn the statement into an article and publish it nationally, coining the idea of the All-American Breakfast, a campaign so successful, bacon has remained an American staple ever since. Bernays would even alter public perception of a young presidential candidate, Calvin Coolidge, from an uptight businessman to the quiet yet effective leader he's known as today. Bernays saw propaganda as an art, and while he did not particularly agree with using it for evil, he recognized and took pride in successful campaigns. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Bernays believed that people were destined to be manipulated, and so it was the job of the intelligent propagandist to choose the least destructive ideas to promote. Or at least, that's what he preached. While working for American Tobacco in 1927, Bernays' plan was to increase the market for cigarettes amongst women by destroying the links between cigarettes and sexual deviance. To do so, he needed to replace this image with something grander. Aristocracy. While working with Lucky Strikes, Bernays knew that green was seen as a masculine color, and thus, Lucky Strikes' green box was unladylike in the hands of women. Changing the packaging would be too expensive, so instead, Bernays used his connections in major fashion design firms to persuade them to start using green in their upcoming designs. Once this was done, he hosted an expensive ball in a five-star hotel, where he hired models to sport the green look, and photographers to publicize the event. Nearly overnight, the color green was seen as the ideal color for powerful and wealthy women rising in the ranks. At this point, George W. Hill was incredibly impressed with Bernays, but still had a pressing problem he needed solved. How do we get women to feel comfortable to smoke publicly? So, like before, he called on Bernays to help. Bernays enlisted the help of psychoanalyst Dr. A. A. Brill, who indicated women's hesitance to smoke publicly came from a deep-rooted fear of public ostracizing. This gave Bernays a brilliant idea, to dismantle the social norms around smoking in his typical exaggerated fashion. Bernays would contact his friends he made at Vogue magazine and hire a group of 30 beautiful women, who he called debutantes, a word meaning young upper-class woman. He then told these women to sneak into the 1929 Easter Parade in New York City so they can march down Fifth Avenue, lighting lucky strikes to protest gender inequality. And they did. One of the largest events of the year, with hundreds of media organizations covering it, was overshadowed in minutes by 30 beautifully dressed aristocratic women, all openly smoking lucky strike cigarettes. An extreme message of rebellion at the time, and one that was very much heard. The media exploded, and Bernays wasted no time, pulling the strings of news networks to paint the stunt as a strong message against oppression, and denoting lucky strikes as torches of freedom, and symbols of the women's rights movement. Within months, the image of rich women smoking spread across the country, and the Torches of Freedom campaign officially made the conversation around women's smoking and overall women's rights synonymous. The result was Lucky Strikes becoming the highest selling cigarette in the country by the end of the year. The Torches of Freedom campaign was a landmark event in public relations. Cigarettes went from the sign of becoming a man to an open display of public disobedience and female strength. Bernays would continue his streak of morally questionable PR for years to come. In the 1940s, he would be hired by the United Fruit Company to promote bananas a company that profited from an agreement with a ruthless dictator who allowed horrid working conditions in Guatemala to keep wages down and profits up. When the country was overthrown by a democratic coup in 1945 and had their first elected leader, profits shrunk as workers' rights laws were beginning to pass under the new government. Bernays was able to spin the coup as an attempt to spread communism to the United States. He sparked so much hatred for the rebels that a second coup funded by the United States reinstated a dictatorship, bad working conditions, and more profitable bananas only a few years later. 
Bernays proved that even when directly knowing the cost of an action, the masses can be convinced to do just about anything, as long as the story is spun just right. He never shied away from what he did, openly using the words propaganda and psychological warfare. However, he had lines he refused to cross, such as when he refused to work for the Nazi party or the likes of Richard Nixon. But that didn't stop him from boasting about Josef Goebbels using his tactics to sell Nazism. While he didn't agree, he definitely saw it as an honor and a nod to his work. Bernays believed that propaganda was a necessary tool, and one that should be used for good, but knew it could never be perfect. People will be manipulated one way or the other. It is the duty of a good propagandist to promote the best ideas for society. In short, Bernays saw the idea of propaganda as the engineering of consent. He was never persuading anyone. He wanted to show them a world in which they would come up with the idea themselves. Bernays not only sold cigarettes, he revolutionized the way companies perform public relations. The use of social change as a vessel for promoting goods is all too commonplace now. It has worked so well, many even demand companies attach themselves to social causes to be worthy of our dollars today. Maybe it is a good thing that the population, whether manipulated or not, believes that social change in business should be won. Maybe it is what is best for society, and those at the very top, those we cannot see, are making those decisions for us. Propaganda is the executive arm of the invisible government. Bernays would die at the great age of 103, a genius man who came to hate how others butchered his creation. He would later reflect on his Torches of Freedom campaign. Age-old customs, I learned, could be broken down by a dramatic appeal, disseminated by the network of media. Of course, the taboo was not destroyed completely, but a beginning had been made, one I regret today. Bernays understood what he had done. The greatest PR man who ever lived opened Pandora's box and change the way we live, consume, and think forever. Sometimes it makes you wonder how much of the things we think about ourselves were actually placed in our heads by a carefully crafted PR campaign. In the modern age, we have PR for and against smoking, for and against foods, war, politicians, movies, games, pornography, books, TV, and so much more. As Bernays himself put it, Public relations today is horrible. Any dope, any nitwit, any idiot can call himself or herself a public relations practitioner. It's not good PR. It intensifies the antagonism toward the product. I'm pleased to be known as the father of public relations when the field is taken seriously. So ask yourself, are you convinced? Are you convinced you're free? Free to think, do, and say as you please. Free from addiction, habits, and thoughts that are not your own. If you are, I'm proud of you. And if you aren't, you're right.